All right, Judges chapter 15. Let's dig right into the chapter here. Look down in your Bibles here in verse number 1. The Bible says, But it came to pass, within a while after, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber. But her father would not suffer him to go in. So just to recap from last week where we are in the story, uh, chapter 14, remember they had the, the feast and the wedding and the, the companions, the 30 companions that he had there that, that um, was typical to have during a feast that he needed provided for him of the Philistines. They made that bet. The seven days of the, of the ceremony, you know, they, at the very end, the very last day, they, they had gotten it out of him, out of, out of his wife, what the answer to his riddle was. And he got real angry after he lost that bet. And basically what he did is he just went back to his father's house. Because they were in the land of the Philistines, he went down to where she lived. They had this great feast. They got married. They had everything going on, and then he just was so upset by losing that because she told them the answer to his riddle that he's just like, well, I'm just going home. So now he's cooled off a bit. Now he decides, all right, it's time to go back down, and I'm going to go in, and I'm going to go in under my wife, and, and he goes down to her father's house. And that's what it says here. And he brings a kid. So he's basically kind of bringing his peace offering, right? He's bringing his... The, this gift, this kid, and, and hey, let's make up, you know, I'm back, you know, and, and move on with his life. And that's what he goes down there to do. But the dad meets him and doesn't allow him in the house. Like, no, uh, no, I can't let you in. Verse number two says, and her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So he says, well, you know, I just thought you didn't want to be married to her anymore and you just left, so I gave her to someone else to be wife. That's a pretty wicked thing. I mean, it's, they were married and it's referred to multiple times in the last chapter and in this chapter, it's his wife. Now, we don't know for sure if he consummated the marriage or not, but it doesn't matter when you're married, you're married. I mean, there's still that, um, the, only, the only way that would make any difference would be, and, and I'm not going to go into this tonight, but when the Bible says that there's, you know, one way, basically there's one reason in the law that God allows for divorce. There's one situation and it says, ex Jesus said, except it be for fornication. Now, that provision in the law of allowing for divorce because of fornication is something that happens basically before a marriage is consummated, before the man and the wife come together. You're espoused, but haven't full, fulfilled and consummated that marriage yet where the husband and wife have become one flesh. And we have a perfect example of this in the scripture with Joseph and Mary. When Mary, Mary and Joseph were espoused to one another, Joseph found out that Mary was with child. Obviously, it was a miracle, right? It was of the Holy Ghost. She did not lay with another man. She did not cheat on Joseph and go out and commit fornication by, you know, because of her pregnancy. It was something that was of God. But the Bible says that Joseph, being a, uh, he was a righteous man, he was minded to put her away privily. So he was going to divorce her. He's going to do it privately and not make a big deal out of it. But when he found out that, that she was pregnant, obviously there's usually, in every other situation, there's only one way that that could happen. So he was thinking that, okay, well, uh, this is the allowance that God has put in there. This is a provision that she has committed fornication. He didn't know that. He thought she was a virgin. No, she committed fornication. So that was allowable. The reason what the difference is between fornication is that once you're married and you commit fornication, it's called adultery. So the Bible gives a death penalty on adultery, but when it comes to marriage, if someone was a fornicator, then they could put away their wife prior to the consummation of that marriage. But once, the, what, once God has joined together the man and the woman, let not man divide it asunder. And that's what the Bible teaches on that. And... Um, so I don't even know how I got off on that. But basically, you know, he came in unto his wife 
but um, we don't know if they consummated marriage or not, but it, they still didn't get divorced. You know, he just basically just gave her to be someone else's wife. And he shows up and, he, and, then, he's, and then he tries to like appease him by saying, well, look, isn't, isn't her younger sister more beautiful than she is anyways? I mean, isn't she fairer? Like, like how about this? She's got a younger sister. She's better anyways. Just, just take her, right? And that does not satisfy Samson. Verse number three says, And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. So he's, he's angry and he's going <coughs> to take vengeance on them. Now, what I found is kind of interesting about this is that he says, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines. These are his in-laws. And he just refers to them as the Philistines, just kind of this, this blanket. Now he's doing harm unto the family or the household of of you know, this woman, but he's saying that now I'm going to be more blameless than the Philistines. I think this still goes to reinforce my belief that he wanted to start a fight with them, that he wanted to seek occasion against them. So he's just like, well, you Philistines, right? Just kind of broad, you know, now I'm going to be more blameless than, than all of you Philistines by whatever I do unto you. And it says here in verse number four, it says, and Samson went and caught 300 foxes. Now catching 300 foxes, I have no idea how long this would take him. Obviously, you know, Samson had the Spirit of the Lord upon him quite a bit, but I don't even think I'd be able to catch one without setting up some kind of trap or something. But he catches 300 foxes. That's a lot of foxes. And it says he took firebrand. So basically, he just takes a, you know, like a burning piece of wood or whatever, like a torch, and uh, he turned tail to tail. So he catches these foxes, puts their tails next to each other, lights a fire in the middle, and then lets them run out into the field and um, set the, all their vineyards and olive yards and everything that they had, basically is burning it down to the crown because you've got these foxes now just running all over the place with their tails on fire. And foxes have some pretty bushy tails too. So I, you know, I, I assume that's the reason why he chose to, to pick foxes to go out and do this. But, uh, but this is what he did. Bible says it, I believe it, 300 foxes put them tail to tail, and just sent them out to, to burn down their standing corn. That's what's in verse number five. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the, into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. So he destroys quite a bit of, uh, of their food, of their food supply. And again, we don't know specifically how much and how many people were impacted by this, but I don't think he cared. I mean, I think he was just, okay, well, you Philistines, you did me wrong. Now I'm going to do you wrong. And um, verse number six says, then the Philistine said, who hath done this? So obviously this is not the father-in-law. This is not the people directly now because they know who did it. They know what was done. Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion and the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. So this is now what the Philistines end up doing because they, they say, hey, we don't want this guy coming after us anymore. And now they're angry that the father-in-law had done these things. Now they're suffering because, they, you know, and, and this is how these, these wars start and these fights start. Like they start off with one person doing wrong to someone else. And then they go, well, no, now I'm going to get vengeance on you. And now you've done this to me and I'm going to go back and forth and back and forth. And things just escalate and get worse and worse and worse. So then they go back and they say, well, okay, now we're going to burn this woman and her father with fire. We're going we're to kill them for bringing this on us. And then Samson says in verse 7, And Samson said to them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you. And after that I will cease it. And then I'm done. Now I'm going to stop. One, oh man, I can't believe you killed her. You know, this was my wife and, and I had to deal with this. And now you've come and killed her. So now I'm going to go and, and cause even more problems for you and do more damage and more destruction. Now, keep your place here and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. I want to preach a little bit about the subject of vengeance and taking revenge. Now, we know in this story, again, in the context, Samson's trying to just start a fight with the Philistines. This is what he's trying to do. He's trying to overthrow them from, from, from oppressing them, and, and he's taking every opportunity he possibly can to just to use it to just fight against them. 
I believe completely that's what he's doing here. But I, also, I do definitely want to teach because we see this back and forth type of attitude. We can't get caught up and it's not right for us to get caught up into having a vengeful type of an attitude or a mindset. All throughout scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, the Bible teaches that God is the one that does revenge. He's the one that's the avenger. He's the one that's going to take care of matters. Now, there is a stipulation in the law where you could have a revenger of blood if your family member or someone gets killed, that you would be the one basically to execute judgment upon that person. However, that's still supposed to be managed and done through the law. They're supposed to be found guilty, and then they are able to, to carry out that punishment. And, uh, there, you know, there's situations that are allowed for, you know, to one degree or another in Scripture of someone who's an avenger of blood, you know, because they're so upset because those things happen. But uh, I'm not going to get into all that tonight. But the concept of us just taking vengeance and taking matters in our own hands and righting every wrong, according to Scripture, is not something that we should be doing. Look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 31. The Bible says, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? Verse 35, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. This is the Lord speaking. This is the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And when he says, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense, that's God. He's saying, I'm the one who brings vengeance. I'm the one who will repay the wicked for what they're doing. So this is referenced, and again, without going deep into the context here, it's just referring to wicked people. Their vine is vine of Sodom. Their rock's not like our rock. And basically, when they do evil, and they do wicked things, the Bible says, God's saying, to me belong with vengeance and recompense. I'll make sure it's right. I'll make sure it's taken care of. Uh, turn to Psalm 94. Actually, no, turn to Romans 12. I'll read Psalm 94 for you. Psalm 94, verse number one, the Bible basically saying the same thing. It's ascribing to the Lord as the one who uh, is the one who carries out vengeance. It says in Psalm 94, 1, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. So this is a psalm calling out to God. And God, vengeance belongs to you. Lift up yourself now. Show yourself, God. You're the judge of the earth. You're the judge of these matters. You're the one who's going to take care of it. You're the one who's going to right the wrong. Render a reward to the proud. This is a plea from a righteous person unto God, asking God to bring forth his judgment. Because it's not up to us to, to, to take the matters in our own hands. This is a matter where, where God is being entreated to be the judge. Verse number three, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? It is a vexation when wicked people are triumphing and, and beating down righteous people. It's not right. It shouldn't happen. And it's right to be upset about those things. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with getting angry about the wicked or, or wanting to see God bring forth judgment on wicked people and right the things that are wrong. God's given us a sense of justice. He's given us, instilled us with that, with a conscience, with a sense of judgment and what's right and what's wrong and, and our own morality. God's given that to us. Now, obviously, we need his word to instruct us completely, but even just, just being born with this stuff, naturally, he's given us a sense of right and wrong, and you shouldn't do this. And when someone transgresses against someone else or violates someone else, yeah, they ought to be punished. Amen. And there is satisfaction that, that, sh that can and should be received when somebody is punished for what they've done. And this is, this is a fact, and it is a fact of the way that, that human beings were created by our Creator, by, by God the Father in heaven. 
when people have been abused, especially sexually or physically, what happens oftentimes is that especially when it comes in cases of, of you know, the this, this child abuse and things like that, it comes from a source that's close to the family, someone who's well-liked or loved, and, and no one would ever suspect. And the damage that's done to the victims when, one, they're not believed, and then when things come out, it's, oh, let's just brush this under the table, let's not talk about this, it's not a big deal, and then that person never gets brought to justice, that has a huge impact on the recovery of the victim having to see that and put up with that and have something so horrible done to them and then no justice. Right. Whatever happened to this? As opposed to the person who sees, you know, especially, I mean, think about a young child who's defiled who already just can't, it's, it's, it's hard enough to comprehend this happening as an adult. For me as an adult, comprehending what happens to some of these children. But then as a child, from a child's frame of view, to understand what, what's happening and the guilt that gets associated with that and they know that this is not right and then they're a part of it, but even though they don't want to be, there's so many things that go along with that. But when they can see somebody get taken and get strung up on a rope or get a bullet put through their head because that's what they deserve for defiling a young child and they can see this is how we deal with people that do that type of thing. You know what? At least they can help that victim get past because they can see, yeah, that really was wicked. And it was dealt with. And now I could maybe move. Yeah, yeah, they're still going to have scars. Yeah, it's still going to hurt what was done to them. Yeah, there still could be damage, but at least they could move forward knowing that they got what was coming to them and that justice was done. Amen. Now, the good thing is, and then look, this, and then, well, like I said, let me just finish off this point. God instilled us with that as human beings, to be able to move on and get forward once, that, once the, the judgment has been, has been given out. And that's why God made the laws and the punishments the way he did. He's the one who balances out what's appropriate. God's the one who decides how bad is, is a crime really. Is it really that bad? Well, if you ever want to know how bad a crime is, read the Bible. Read Leviticus. Read Deuteronomy. And look and see what God spells out is, hey, if someone's caught doing this or doing that, this is what you do to them. That'll give you a pretty good idea of how bad of a crime it is. Someone's caught stealing, they have to return fourfold or fivefold or sevenfold or whatever. Right? If someone's caught committing adultery, well, you put them to death. You know, that sounds like a pretty, a pretty severe crime to me. And I'm not going to go through all the, there's all kinds of different punishments and there's different crimes. Look it up for yourself. But that gives us uh, the ability to move forward. But, but here's the other, the other thing that's, that's good about God, what's great about God, is that God is a just judge. So that even when people can circumvent the system that we have here on earth, and you have the pedophiles that get thrown in prison for a year or two, and then they go back on the streets, and then they do the same thing, and they become these repeat offenders, and they never really seem to have any justice brought forward against them, there's a righteous God in heaven. And he's going to make sure that everything is accounted for. Amen. And the wicked people of this world that can continue to just do wickedly, God's got a special place called hell. That if they get around everything that, that, that happens in this world, they can't escape hell. And we can at least take comfort when, when, when someone is in that state and they don't seem to be getting the, uh, the proper punishment, you know, you know what? God's going to deal with that person. And even as a victim, you don't have to go and, and take the matter into your own hand. You don't have to go and, and right the wrong. Because God sees what happens. God knows. And, and, and you better believe that if anyone's going to be righteous about something, God will. And what we see in Psalm 94, I'm reading this for you. I didn't have you turn there. You're still in Romans 12, but... What we see here is this attitude of, well, Lord, you know, judge for us. Take care of these people. Take care of this problem for us. Stand up for us, Lord. Verse number four, how long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. 
These are extremely wicked people that we're talking about, and we're going to get into this in just a minute. But I want you to notice this since I'm reading Psalm 94 right now, that the, the, the people being described here, this isn't your average sinner. I mean, I, who here is without sin? Nobody. We're all sinners. But the person who's killing widows and strangers and the fatherless and these people who can't defend them, you know, like, like, that's a special type of wicked person who's plotting this stuff. And you could read all about this in the scripture. And, and they're referred to as the wicked. Generally speaking, in, in the vast majority of times, the Bible refers to someone as, you know, as, to, as to a group of people being the wicked people. I believe it's talking about children of Satan, children of the devil. People who, as, a, as the book of Proverbs describes, they, they go to bed at night and they're plotting how they're going to do harm to somebody. They're just, they're constantly being mischievous and, and thinking and, and making plans to do evil unto people. That is not your average unsaved person. It's hard for a normal person, which would be your average unsaved person or your average saved person, to even comprehend how could somebody be like that? I was an unsaved person. I wasn't plotting and planning how can I hurt people. You were probably the same way when you were unsaved. Think about it. However long ago that was. Were you just spending your time thinking, being devious, and, and what can I do to, to, to steal from people and hurt people and kill people? No. But you know what? Those people exist. Yeah. That's right. And sometimes it's hard to even recognize that they exist because it's so foreign to you. You're just thinking, how could anybody be like that? Right. They're out there. Yeah, that's and that's what the Bible calls the wicked. Children of the devil. They're wicked. And these are the people that you'll find in the book of Psalms, these imprecatory type prayers where, where you're, you're wishing destruction on them, they're wishing death on them, you're asking God, judge these people. That's who that is directed towards. And again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's read Romans chapter 12. What are we teaching here about, about Samson and this story that happened? He's going back and forth and back and forth. Things continue to escalate and, and there's more and more and more damage being done as there's this back and forth battle. Well, you did this to me. Now I'm going to get even with you. Well, you did this to me. Now I'm going to even with you. Well, you did even more to me. Now I've got to even things up. I've got to square it up. And it just continues and doesn't stop. Well, Romans 12 tells us how we can get these things to stop and what our attitude ought to be as believers. Uh, verse number 17 in Romans 12, the Bible reads, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Remember the Bible says that recompense belongs unto the Lord. Right. We are not to recompense to any man evil for evil. So if someone does you evil, you don't do evil back to that person. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. This is our command. We need to remember this. Especially... Believing what you believe, preaching what you preach, whatever, out in a world where the truth is being more and more hated every day, as much as li lieth in you, still live peaceably with all men. We're not out trying to get in fights. We're just trying to preach the truth. That's our job. That's our mission. We want to get people saved. We want to preach the word of God. Trying to be at peace with people. Just like David said, when I speak, he said, I am for peace. But when I speak, they're for war. Right. Why? Because get, they get angry at the words that you say. And then they want to fight you and attack you and kill you. He's like, hey, I'm not, I'm not trying to start a fight here. Just, thus saith the Lord. Verse number 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance belongs unto God. We can put aside that wrath. Just give place unto wrath. It's not saying it's a sin to get angry when someone does you wrong, but he's saying just put the wrath aside and, and don't go out and avenge yourself. If someone does you wrong, God will take care of it. Let him do his job. Verse 20, Therefore, so for this reason, because we know that God will repay, we know that God is a God of vengeance, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. 
You say, well, what does that mean? If I'm doing good unto my enemy, if, if, if they're doing bad to me, but then I do good to them, I feed them, hey, he's, there's my enemy, he hates me, he has it out for me, oh, he's thirsty, here's a cup of water. How is that heaping coals of fire on his head? Because when your enemy does wrong to you, when you've given them zero reason to do good, it's that much worse. And then not only have you given them no reason to attack you and fight you, when you're only doing good unto them, and you're going out of your way and doing good unto somebody, and they still hate you and they still come, well, that's even worse. Because the just judge sees that, he goes, well, you know, they're being good unto you and you're doing evil unto them. That's really bad. And, and God will right that wrong. And the more unbalanced it is because you're doing so much good and they're doing evil to you, that's so much more God is going to recompense and God is going to repay. That's how you doing good is actually going to just bring more coals of fire on their head. They're going to get that much more judgment as a result because they have no business you know, doing evil unto you when you do good unto them. And then verse 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is the second reason why, you know, we should be good unto our enemies. One, you could just be like, okay, well, since God's taking care of it, if I'm good unto them, they'll just get that much more punishment anyways. But also, we don't want to be overcome of the evil. When someone does evil unto you, if you're overcome, then you're going to go and return evil unto them, which is exactly what the Bible says not to do. Let's overcome that evil with good. When you do good, you know what? When you do good to someone, and again, this is talking about your enemy. This isn't talking about a reprobate hater of God. And we're going to get into that here in just a minute. But every, anybody can have an enemy. You could have an enemy. I mean, you shouldn't, but you can have an enemy that's another believer. Someone who's an adversary to you. Someone who doesn't like you. Now, we're commanded to love the brethren. That shouldn't be the case, but it's possible. Or you could have just some, some random person that, that they're your enemy. You don't get along. You butt heads. Whatever. Whatever the case may be. In order to prevent this escalation of things just getting worse and worse, well, hey, if you do good unto them, oftentimes that could just stop the fighting in its tracks. You've done bad to me. Now I'm going to go and do something. You've done bad to me. Now I'm going to do something good to you. It's a lot harder for people, unless they really do have an evil, wicked heart, to then take it to the next level and still continue to do wrong to you once you've already done nice to them. You see this oftentimes, there's a lot of stories of kids, right? Who, one kid's picking on another kid at school or whatever, and then the kid getting picked on does something nice, and then all of a sudden they just become friends and they're friends for a real long time. You know, stupid kid stuff, but it's, it's that same base mentality where someone could be your enemy one day and then because you overcome evil with good, you could turn out being best friends. And this is the way, this is the attitude that we ought to have. We ought to allow the, the, the attacks, the evil, whatever is done to us to be able to roll off our shoulders and say, okay, I don't have to deal with this. God will deal with this. I'm going to keep moving on and doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And not just that, you know what? If someone does evil to me, I'll do good unto them. funny. I just had a thought pop into my head of, of something personal where I wasn't even thinking about this verse, but this happened recently for me, but I'm not going to share that tonight. Uh, let's continue on here. Proverbs 24. Turn, if you would, please, to Proverbs 24. And then also we're going to be looking at Psalm 58. This is where I was getting a little bit ahead of myself. And this is why it's important to study the Bible and um, be able to understand what our attitudes ought to be, how we ought to behave, because sometimes you run across things that might seem to be contradictions. We see in Romans 12 what we just read, you know, if, if your enemy hungers, feed them. Hey, if they're, you know, if they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And, and it sounds like we need to be just doing good unto them. And even what we've already seen, you know, Psalm 94, we read, 
you know, there's the a psalm being given, a prayer unto God. God, deal with these people. Take vengeance on these people. That sounds like a different attitude than be good to these people. Bless these people, right? Where Jesus said, love your enemies. Well, if I love my enemies, why am I going to ask God to bring vengeance on my enemies? How do you reconcile that? Here's another example. It's uh, Proverbs 24. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. So when your, your enemy falls, when he fails, when something bad happens to him, the Bible says here in the book of Proverbs, don't be happy about that. Don't rejoice. That shouldn't bring you joy when your enemy stumbles and falls. And, it's, and it says, let not thine heart be glad. That shouldn't bring you joy when your enemy stumbles. Verse 18 says, lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turn away his wrath from him. Now, how do we reconcile this with Psalm 58? So turn to Psalm 58. Don't be happy when your enemy falls, right? Psalm 58, verse number 6. The Bible reads, Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. Verse 10. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance, he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. They're so happy at the judgment coming down on these people, they're washing their feet in their blood. It's a pretty graphic scene. I mean, if you really think about that, literally, these people are being destroyed, that their blood is, you know, just filling the streets or whatever. And it says the righteous, they're... <laughs> To wash my feet in their blood. And it says they shall rejoice. How do you reconcile the two? Didn't it just, didn't it just say rejoice not when your enemy falls? Yet this is saying the righteous are going to rejoice when the vengeance comes. How do you, rec how do you reconcile this? Because otherwise, we, we, one option is to say, well, Obviously, it's not the Word of God because there's this glaring contradiction in Scripture. So, just throw it away. I mean, it, it's, this isn't of God. This is of men. Or, you can study out Scripture a little bit more and understand the differences here. As I was already teaching on, there's a difference, and you'll find this all throughout the Bible. Do your own study on this and see it for yourself. There's a difference between your enemy, whoever your enemy is. You can have lots of different types of enemies for lots of different reasons. As I mentioned before, people who don't like you, maybe people on the job, whatever, right? A lot of people can be your enemies. There's a difference between that and the wicked who are God's enemies. An enemy of God. And we read Romans chapter 1, it, it refers to people who are reprobate, people who have been given over to reprobate mind as being enemies of God. And this is who the Bible describes as the wicked. So the wicked in Psalm 58, we want to see the wicked brought to justice. We want to see children of the devil destroyed. There's no hope for them. They've already been given over to a reprobate mind. And this goes into the reprobate doctrine and teaching, which unfortunately I don't have enough time to really go into tonight. But people have a hard time with this doctrine. But basically the doctrine goes like this. Just as much as once you decide to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born again. You become a child of God. You have eternal life. You could never lose that. You can never be unborn as a child. You are God's child forever. The same way there are people who have made the choice to not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've heard the gospel. They've rejected the gospel. They've rejected God. And they've become born again too, except they were born unto Satan. 
They become a child of the devil. They become a child of Satan in the same way that a believer, they can't be unborn from being a child of God. The child of the devil, when they've been born into the devil's family, they can never be unborn either. It's a permanent position that they have as a child of the devil. Look up the key phrases, child of the devil, in Scripture. This is homework for you. Do this for yourself so you can see it. See what Jesus, who Jesus refers to as people being children of the devil and how he speaks to them versus your average unsaved person. This is who the Bible refers to as the wicked, the people who are doing heinous crimes, the people who cannot cease from being evil, the, the people who are referred to in the book of Jude, the people who are referred to in the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, eyes who's, you know, that cannot cease from sin, Hearts they filled with covetous practices. There's so many descriptions of these people. The wicked people, because there's no hope for them, we want to just see God's vengeance come on them. Amen. They're the ones that are leading the charge against the righteous. It's not your average unsaved people. Just like Jesus said about the Roman soldiers, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They didn't just have it out for Jesus. They were soldiers. Yeah, they were sinning. Yeah, they shouldn't have done that. But they were kind of just doing their job and whatever. They were unbelieving. And, but they're not the ones that brought, them, brought Jesus before Pilate and said, crucify him, crucify him. Right. It's a big difference. Yeah. The ones who brought him forward and said, this man's of the devil, crucify him and kill him. That's the wicked after he's just been done healing and preaching the gospel of peace, crucify this man. That's the wicked. And there's a huge difference between the two types of people. And it's important to understand this because this is going to help you just to understand Scripture. When you see potentially contradictory type of verses in teaching, yes, we are to love our enemies. Yes, when you have someone that, that is a, an adversary, a Roman soldier, in Jesus' case. We're taught to love that person. Do good unto them. Hey, they're doing evil unto you, do good unto them. Jesus did good unto the Roman soldiers. When he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. They did evil unto him. But then read what the Bible says about Judas and when you understand, in the book of Psalms, and I forget exactly the Psalm 68, maybe. I forget the exact reference. Another one to look up. Referring to um, this prophecy of Judas. And there's a curse on Judas. Where, it's, where it says, you know, let, let his... Uh, Habitation be desolate. Let his 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 um, mother, you know, mourn the loss of her children. And I mean, it just goes. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Let let his let his whole household be desolate. Like just just this extreme curse against him. And then realize this is from the perspective of Jesus Christ, right. because the 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 pronouns being used is against him. While Jesus basically gives a blessing on the people who have done evil unto him and the Roman soldiers, he's also at the same time giving this extreme curse on Judas. Why? Because Judas was a devil. These other guys are just unbelievers. Judas was a, was a child of the devil. Two different categories of people. The vast majority of people in this world are unbelievers. That's, that's the, the, the highest percentage of people you have a very small percentage of people who are saved that are believers. The Bible says that there's few that are saved, essentially. And then you also have a small percentage of people who are children of the devil. And then everyone else is just your average unsaved person. And the way that you deal with the different groups of people is outlined for us in Scripture, but you have to study. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Let's go back to Judges chapter 15. So I just wanted to, I wanted to give that extra little bit of teaching uh, tonight just on that subject at large since we're seeing here Samson going back and forth with the Philistines. Now, again, 
in this in the story in Judges, Samson is is literally just provoking the Philistines and trying to trying to overthrow them for being a, the oppressive rulers that they were. He's doing everything he can to start these fights with them. And, uh, and we show that, that ultimately God's behind him when he keeps on pouring his spirit upon him and, and allowing him to have the strength to do all these things that he's doing. Verse number nine, the Bible says, Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are you come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson are we come up, to do to him as he hath done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock, Edom, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. Now, Samson goes back to his own people. He's among his own brethren. He's, he's in Judah. And when, uh, it says here, he's at the top of the rock. When the Philistines come up, they, they gather this great force to go and try to get Samson now because he's caused them so much problems. What do his own brethren do? Do they defend him? They say, no, you can't have Samson. I mean, no, you guys are wicked. No, you know, no. Okay, we'll go get him for you. And then what do they do? They berate Samson. Don't you know that the Phil Philistines are rulers over us? This is the same lame attitude that modern day Christians have over, you know, oh, don't you know that the government says that you can't do that? Don't you know that the, hey, what are you doing going into those apartment complexes that say no soliciting? You're going to preach the gospel. That, don't you know that that's against the law? Don't you know what the... No, no, we're going to... No, you did wrong. No, sorry, brother, but you did wrong. You got to go face for your, you know, what you did. It's a lame excuse for, for children of God is, what, is what's happening here. How pathetic. They're siding with the Philistines. And this is what makes me sick, and this ought to make you sick too, when you have someone who's supposed to be a child of God, they're supposed to be, in this case, you know, children of Israel, standing for what's right, taking the side of the Philistines, something ain't right. Amen. That's right. Taking the side of the devil, taking the side of the wicked, and getting on their side, uh-uh. You know, choose you this day whom you will serve. They chose to serve the Philistines. Don't you know they're the rulers over us? Don't you know God's the ruler over you? Amen. Don't you side over the, with the wicked people over the righteous? Yeah. Samson ended up judging Israel for 20 years. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him I don't know how many times. He was doing what was right. In the end, he was picking his fight, trying to free the children of Israel, trying to break their bondage. And they want to be in bondage. They want to be enslaved. Don't you know that there are rulers? You can't do that. It makes me sick to see the modern day Christians that are going to take the side of the Sodomites Amen. over the man of God that's going to stand up and try to fight the filth that's being crammed on our throats on a regular basis. Yep. And I've seen this firsthand. I witnessed it and it makes me sick to my stomach. And this is one of the reasons why I decided to be a pastor. It's because I'm sick of people not standing up with the man of God, with somebody who's willing to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, with someone who's willing to stand up and say, this is wicked and abominable and we shouldn't tolerate it. And when someone stands up and says, this is what the Bible says, the Bible says it's, it's, it's punishable by the death penalty, the Bible says that it's abominable, and you've got modern day Christians going, oh, who are you to judge? And they're going to say, no, no, we're going to side with the sodomite. And we don't want to have anything to do with you. We're not going to associate with you. We're going we're to berate you and belittle you and side with the, with the precious homos. Makes me sick to my stomach. These were the types of people that Samson had to deal with. They're ready to 
send them off to the Philistines. Well, we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna tie you up, Samson. We don't want to face the persecution of the Philistines. Samson had no problem fighting against them. He was willing to fight. These people, they tuck tail and run. Oh, no, the Philistines are here. Well, let's get rid of the troublemaker. Don't be surprised. People who you think are on your side, the heat gets turned up a little bit. They're going to blame it all. It's easy to blame it all on Samson, right? They tried to do the same thing to Moses. They're in bondage. They're suffering. They're suffering at the hands of evildoers. And then it's, oh, let's blame Moses. Let's blame Moses. for He's such a troublemaker. He's always stirring the pot. Can't he just do what he's supposed to do? Can't he just do what Pharaoh told him to do? Now our lives are miserable. It's wicked. Amen. And this is the same reaction that these similar type of Christians today will be saying about, oh, Pastor Versions, why did, why did you have to say that on public TV? Why are you causing so much problems? Now, now I have to answer for this. Now, why are you causing me so many problems? Now my family's coming after you. Why are you causing all these problems? Look, it's not me. Why are you siding with, with the evil people? Why are you siding with wicked people? Why don't you stand for what God stands for? Why don't you choose a side and stick with it? Why don't you get on the right side? Don't be one of these pansies that are coming. Well, we, we're here to tie you up, Samson, and deliver you unto, unto the Philistines. Don't you know there are rulers? And all Samson says, hey, just, just promise me you're not going to kill me yourself. Right? So what are you here for? You're, oh, you're going to tie me up and bring me down there? Just promise you're not going to kill me. It says in verse 13, And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand. But surely we will not kill. <laughs> of course not, brother. You're, I mean, you're, you're one of, we're not going to kill you. We're just going to let them do it. We're going to deliver you into them and, and whatever they do with you, you know, hopefully they won't think too poorly upon us. You wicked people. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. But this is the hope that the man of God has even when people are supposed to be supporting him end up not supporting him. Because if you're doing what God wants you to do, and if you're making the stands that what God wants you to make, He'll make sure that if everybody turns their back on you, He won't. Right. He's there with you. And what happens here? And when He came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against Him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Him. God and Samson, that's all He needs. He doesn't need those, those pansies. He doesn't need those, those weak Christians. So you know, they're going to, they're gonna, oh, don't you know? He's like, he doesn't need them. The Spirit of God came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became his flax that was burned with fire, and his bands loose from off his hands. God gave him the strength. It says here in verse 15, And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. He killed a thousand people with a jawbone. So you know, what can I, you know, there's a thousand Philistines here that are after me. All right, let's do this. <laughs> and he pulls up a jawbone and... and Why was he able to do that, though? The Spirit of God came upon him. Wouldn't it be better, though, if, if Judah said, Hey, we're with you. We may not agree with, you know, the way that you say things, Samson. We may not agree with your riddles. But you know what? We don't want these wicked Philistines ruling over us. We don't like being in bondage, so we're going we're gonna to join with you and stand on the right side of things. Amen. Amen. Would to God that, that God's people can have that type of an attitude. Instead of nitpicking over the, the small details or the finer points, 
Well, I don't think, I don't think the, the homos are reprobates. Okay, so just take their side then, right? right? Just, just go ahead and condemn the person who's trying to just preach the Bible and live righteously and, and, and proclaim the wickedness of this because you don't, you don't believe in that detail. Yeah. And that's what we see happening in our, in our modern day uh, climate of, of the Judeans, the Jews. <laughs> I'm not going to go down that path. Verse number 17. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi. And he was sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. So he was, I mean, killing a thousand people jawbone of an ass, I guess, takes a little bit out of you. I can't even imagine. I've done a little bit of, of wrestling or fighting or whatever. Just spending like a minute or two in a fight, I mean, that takes a lot out of you. Can you imagine? I mean, how long does it take to kill a thousand people? I don't know. I mean, even if it's taken them, let's say it's just one blow. You kill, what, three people a minute? I mean, that's still a lot of fighting. I mean, it, <laughs> we're, we're talking hours. Yeah, he was a little bit thirsty after that. And, uh, and, and then he just calls on God, you know, God, you've, you've given me this great delivery, you know, don't let me die here, basically is what he's saying. You, you, you've, you've brought this great victory, don't let me die. Verse 19 says, But God clave in hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore, he called the name thereof in Hackery, which is in Lehi unto this day. What's really cool about this story is how it says that God had already prepared. See, God knows in advance. God knows the beginning from the end. God knows what's going to happen. That new jawbone of the ass that was just positioned properly for Samson to be able to pick it up and kill a thousand people with, God knew all of that. And there just so happened to be a special place, a special hole, a special crevice inside that jawbone that had water in it from a rain, from whatever. God prepared for that to be there for Samson to be there in his time of need. Let's be looking for that little clavin spot where you don't expect to find it to revive your spirit, to let you know that God's with you and he hasn't forsaken you. When you go through Man, I feel like I can't do this anymore. I'm about to die. God's already got you covered. How cool is that? Again, we get, we get wrapped up in, because this is all we know, being in this time, being confined by time. And we just experience moment to moment to moment. And things can feel like they pile up and pile up. And you go, man, I don't know. I mean... There's all this great fight. I'm so weary. I'm so worn. I can't do this anymore. God already knew you were going to go through what you've gone through. God's got a respite for you. God's got that little drink of water, that little bit. Now, he didn't have a full well of water. He had just enough, though, to revive his spirit and to keep him going. That's all he needed. Whatever it is you're going through, God already knew you're going to be going through that. And he will not allow you. He, he's already got things planned out for you. So, so be on the lookout for that. Pray to God. Communicate with him. Look out for that, that water in the jawbone of the ass. Verse 20, And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Samson's a very unique character. We're not done with Samson. We get more next week. But uh, a little bit of insight. Did he do everything the right way? No, I don't think he did. But even though he didn't do everything the right way, God sure did use him a lot, didn't he? I don't know. Maybe there's something to learn about that too. Maybe there's something to learn 
that God can use people that maybe they still don't do everything the right way. Yeah. But they're on the right side and they're willing to yield themselves unto the Lord to do what it is that God wants them to do. We saw this man casting out, casting out devils and he, and he followeth not us. So we forbid him. The Lord said, forbid him not. Maybe they're not doing everything the right way. But hey, if they're on the right side, more, more Christians need to have that attitude. Hey, maybe they're not doing everything the right way. A lot of people think that the way that we do things isn't the right way. But are we, are we serving God? Is God using us? Is God, are, are people getting saved? I think we're on the right side. Let's make sure that we don't get too haughty and puffed up. On, you know, obviously, it's important to do things the right way, and we should strive for that. We want to do things the right way. But let's encourage and help out the brother that's serving God, even if they're not doing everything the right way. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the great wisdom that we could learn from your words. Um, it truly is an unending depth of knowledge. And we thank you so much for providing this for us. God, help us to, to continue to learn every day. Help us to, to understand more and more. Help us to, um, to have a proper spirit about us, not to take matters in our own hands, but just to rest in your judgment. And uh, Lord, to help us to overcome evil with good, even though it's not easy. Our flesh wants to, wants to go on the attack and, and to... Um, repay people who've done evil to us lord help us to be able to overcome that evil with good and uh, lord we just want to bring honor and glory unto your name and to be able to share the great truth of the gospel with as many people as we can it's in jesus name we pray amen